まずかぐや姫でどんな絵を映画を作ろうとしているのかってそんなの分かるじゃないし What a mood This color is like It's going to be sticking out at weird angles and there's nothing I can do What is often considered to be the earliest Japanese prose text is The Tale of the Bamboo Cutter The story of a young woman found within a stalk of bamboo her inventive ways of getting rid of her suitors and the tragic end as she is taken back to the kingdom of the moon It's a simple and beautiful story that has lasted since the 10th century with many different adaptations in Japan throughout the years and today we'll be looking at one of those The Tale of Princess Kaguya This is a 2013 film from Studio Ghibli, written by Isao Takahata and Riko Sakaguchi, and directed by Takahata. It was his final film before his death five years later, and it is absolutely excellent. I only saw this for the first time earlier this year. I watched through all the Ghibli films at the start of the lockdown, which was either six months ago or yesterday. And I fell completely in love with it. I would put this as one of the absolute best of the Ghibli canon, which, given some of the films that they've made, is really saying something. But what is it about this movie that speaks to me so much? What unique element of this sets it apart from other films? Well, I mean, there's a very obvious appeal here that is just jumping right out at us the nuanced discussion of class disparity. Why? What did you think I was going to talk about? We see Princess Kaguya and her family living in two different ways. In the early part of the film, they live in a little shack, her father working out in the forest cutting the bamboo as she goes off having little adventures with her friends. Then they move to this giant mansion where Kaguya has to learn how to be a proper lady, and the suitors come to try and win her. It is through Kaguya that we see how the difference between these two statuses feels. Her adoptive father does manual work out in the bamboo forests and shows no signs that he is unhappy with his lot in life. He and his wife seem content with where they are and relish the chance to raise this child who mystically turned from a doll sized woman to a baby. They take everything about it completely in stride, even when the wife's breast starts suddenly producing milk, which, you know, might give some people pause. This is the life that Kaguya is born into. Or plucked into, I guess. Also, I know she isn't called Kaguya at this point in the film yet, but it's much easier to just call her one thing throughout the whole video than to keep switching back and forth, okay? Okay. Kaguya, who grows really quickly, makes friends with a group of local children, and they're out enjoying the simple pleasures of life out in the country, which is largely just like stealing food. Throughout this whole period, Kaguya is happy. Every little thing brings her joy as she discovers the world throughout her accelerated adolescence. I mean, eating a melon has never looked quite so joyous an experience as this. But fate is conspiring against her, and soon the life she knows will be taken away. While she is out enjoying this life with her friends, her father finds an absolute pile of gold and beautiful robes out in the forest. He interprets this as whatever supernatural force sent Kaguya to them, wanting her to live a life of wealth and luxury. So he goes and buys a mansion, moving Kaguya away in the dead of night, leaving their old life behind, literally leaving an uneaten basket of food that she gathered with her friends just sitting there. When they arrive at the mansion, Kaguya initially gets a moment of joy as she takes in this whole new life. But it's cut very short when she literally trips into what the rest of her experience in this place will be determined by. Lady Sagami. Sagami is a teacher that Kaguya's father has hired to mold her into a proper lady. You see, once in higher society, there are ways that a young woman is expected to act. She has to be taught the rules of this, the traditions that she will have to obey from this point onwards. The film frames these traditions as fairly unnatural. Sagami's appearance is artificial, all white face paint and scouse brows, towering over Kaguya as she drills home these lessons. You immediately feel Kaguya's response to this woman, teaching her that the ways that she acts are wrong as she makes a mockery of her lessons. <laughs> Who can blame her when they go so far as limiting the way that she's even allowed to move? Yeah, go everywhere on your knees, that's going to be good for your legs. Feminist side note, this is clearly a forcing women to be physically subservient thing. Ugh. Much as she clearly feels unease at what she's being forced into, Kaguya eventually relents for her father's sake and commits to learning, slowly having her identity stripped from her so that she can fit in, later having her eyebrows removed, her teeth blackened, and then her face painted white. She's made into this almost inhuman thing who isn't even allowed to enjoy herself. 
ほうきの姫君は口を開けて大笑いになったりしないものです。So Kaguya is taken from this life where she gets to spend time with her friends and explore her curiosity naturally and put into one where her very personhood is taken away from her and she is expected to just acquiesce to this because it's what befits their new upper class status. But their place in that class is perhaps Less than certain. The thing to remember about their place here is that they are transplants. They started out in the working class. Their wealth was gifted to them through magical nonsense, instead of hereditary nonsense, which actually being gifted your riches by moon spirits from a bamboo shoot might actually be the only ethical way to get it. They are what we would call new money. And if there's one thing that rich people who got their money because their relatives who exploited it out of working people died don't like, it's when some of those working people try to take a place among them. Once Kakia comes of age, yeah. her father throws a celebration in her honor, bringing in nobles from all around. This is a bizarre thing where Kaguya, who the party is for, has to sit off behind a screen where no one can see her, further highlighting the dehumanizing effect that moving into this class in this way has on her. She has been turned into an object to try and impress these people, and how do they respond to this? Well. <laughs> It doesn't matter what you do. The rich people simply won't respect you. They won't think you can enter their spaces. They will still view themselves as superior to you because you were not born into it. The thing is, though, they really don't fit there. As I've said, the artificiality required to fit into these traditions takes its toll on Kaguya, and it really isn't helped by her father trying so hard to make them fit. Upon first entering the mansion, she finds her parents dressed like this. The badly applied kabuki-esque makeup really just says everything about how they are trying to fit into this idea that really just isn't them. There are other little hints too. The father flubbing his words when he tries to give a speech. And probably my favourite, the way that he just never gets used to getting through doorways with that hat, but that makeup just distills it clearly into one image. All of this, the wealth, the nobility, the big mansion, the nice clothes, are all just a mask, a performance that they are giving, and not convincingly at that. But a father just keeps on trying to fit in forcing it because he thinks that's what's best for Kaguya. He buys super hard into the idea of these traditions, and that doing them is the right way to be of this class, forcibly rejecting the life that they came from, even hypocritically. Let's just go back to Kaguya's name for a second. As I've said, she only gets the name Kaguya partway through the movie. Early on, her father just calls her Hime, or Princess. But the local kids see how fast she is growing and call her Take Noko, or Little Bamboo. He is furious at this, refusing to have his princess named after Bamboo. But later, when she comes of age, yeah, he gets this guy to come and give her a name befitting a lady of her new stature. He sees her beauty and hears her koto playing and calls her the shining princess of the supple bamboo. Princess Kaguya, and her father is thrilled, declaring it a fine name. So, poor people from your own community call her something because she reminds them of bamboo? That's bad. Some rich guy you've never met before calls her something because she reminds him of bamboo? That's good. It's clear that his belief in all this comes from a dishonest place. He means well. He wants what he thinks is best for Kaguya, but his interpretation of what would make her happy is completely wrong. While we see Kaguya's misery being brought onto her by the attempts to follow these traditions, the film does not think that traditions are inherently bad. It's just that there's traditions and traditions. The film does a lot to frame the traditions of the upper class as artificial and strange, ridiculous posturing that only makes the people doing it look fake. The suitors who come to pursue Kaguya are introduced to us walking in this procession, all wearing these matching robes with absurdly long trains. They are moving so slowly for no reason other than the look of the thing to create the impression of superiority. This is very quickly abandoned once they arrive to try and woo Kaguya and we see just how fake that really was.
with their dignity only being maintained by a servant moving their trains. Also, they want to marry Kaguya without ever having seen her just because they've been told she's beautiful and some kind of magic and they think she's a prize that they deserve to have just because they're rich and... Ah! In direct contrast to the artificiality of everything we see in the upper class traditions, we see the traditions of the working class while Kaguya is among them. Unlike the superfluousness we see through the rest of the film, these are presented as practical things, done with purpose and craft. Her childhood friend Sutomaru's family makes bowls. We see the process as they cut bowls of wood out of logs and carve them into the bowls. This is hard, dirty work, but framed to look noble and worthwhile. The detail put into the animation on this scene gives such a clear picture of the artistry that goes into something so commonplace, and you get the sense that this is how it has always been done, and how it will continue to be done for generations to come, because it is simply the practical way really showing Kaguya a part of a life that she would be happy living before being taken away from it. Within the mansion, there is one place that Kaguya goes to escape from the pressures put on her, a loom house within the garden. Her mother sets up there, having abandoned the falseness of the wealth in a way that Kaguya is not permitted to. This space is humble, small, and dominated by a physical craft, which both she and her mother can do. Again, this is work that we see the physicality of, though we never see the finished product here. It's just a way out of that life a sign of Kaguya's resistance, with her father using that space to tell her to reject their old life. The comfort that she gets from these simple traditional crafts gets slowly stripped from her. We see the extent that she is removed from these roots at one of her lowest moments in the film. Just after the rich people at her coming of age yeah, party have insulted her so badly, she runs, heading right back home. She meets with a man putting together a wood burner to create charcoal. Again, this is a physical task, grimy, dirty and practical, but now done to show how separate she has become. All of her friends have moved on, and she has no way to return to the life she wanted. She doesn't fit here anymore, and can only head back to what she has been forced into. This presentation of working class life is definitely quite romanticised, showing that backbreaking, agonising labour is a happy and pure way to live, not really showing us the hardships of it. Which, as we know, being poor is not easy. It's incredibly hard, in fact, and being wealthy comes with a number of comforts where you will simply never know what that hardship is like at all. Kaguya's purely positive view of it is undoubtedly naive, and comes out of her associating that time with her happy memories and the new position with her depression. We are seeing all of this through her subjective lens. There is an interesting extra layer to all of this though, since Kaguya does not come from Earth originally. She is a spirit from the moon found within a bamboo stalk and aging unnaturally. She wanted to experience life on Earth and got herself sent down, living out her life there until she has to call to the moon for help because the Emperor has decided he wants to marry her, and tries to literally pick her up and take her. Rich people in this movie think women are things! So the moon people come down to take her away, erasing her memories of the life she led on Earth, and she can't do anything to stop it. So Kaguya actually comes from an even higher class, and throughout this whole movie she's just been... a poverty tourist. But if we take the messages put across by the rest of the film and apply it to this, then we can see that her life on the moon is the same empty misery that living in the upper class gives her. Going back to the moon is portrayed as terrifying, and once Kaguya has put it into motion there is just an impending sense of doom. She's built a life here with her family, who she loves even for all their mistakes, and is about to lose it all, and it's crushing to watch. We most clearly see this desperation in the scene where she briefly reunites with Sutomaru. In him, she sees everything of the life that she could have had if her parents hadn't taken her away to the mansion. She could have lived this way, and experiencing it again makes her so happy that she takes flight. A moment of pure joy, only made possible by abandoning the pretense of the roles that she has to follow. But it's cut short because she can't fight having to return to these roles, no matter how much happier she would be elsewhere. <laughs> Kakia gets to see the one place where she could be content, even live there for a while, but it can't last. She is taken away. Her memory of her time on Earth removed halfway through her monologue about the life she lived. <laughs> God damn, this movie destroys me. 
But okay, I've been talking about this movie for over 2600 words now, and I haven't even mentioned how it looks yet. And I'm pretty sure that it's illegal to talk about why Princess Kaguya is so great without at least once yelling, LOOK AT IT! It is simply one of the most beautiful looking films I've ever seen, and frankly makes me wonder why every other movie doesn't look this good. Like, could we have been doing this the whole time? Why didn't they? With whom do I register my complaint? When he set out directing this film, Isao Takahata had a very deliberate goal to make something that no one had ever seen before. <laughs> he and his animators achieved this through deliberately making the characters look rough and uneven with beautiful, lush watercolour backgrounds. This is wildly different to the traditional style of Studio Ghibli's works, including the first couple of Takahata's. What is so beautiful to me about Ghibli films is usually their detail. Little things that a lot of animated films would skip over because you have to draw them and that is hard, but it's what gives them so much life. But in Princess Kaguya, we're dealing with a lot of blank space, giving a lot of the film an ethereal, almost dreamlike feel. And the lack of detail to the characters really lets the incredible performances shine through. I think particular credit should be given to Takeo Chi as the father in his final performance. The footage of him recording some of his lines is just an absolute delight. <laughs> So yeah, it is practically understating things to say that this looks beautiful and is a huge part of the film's appeal. I held off from talking about it until this point for a specific reason though. I wanted you to understand the substance of this theme before we looked at the style of it, because to me the style is part of the substance. You see, I'm doing a thing. But what do I mean by that? I mean, how does the way this looks speak to the film's message of working class traditions being good and freeing while upper class ones are bad and restrictive? Well, to understand that, we'll have to look at the style that this is so strongly emulating. Ukiyoe. Ukiyoe was a type of painting that originated in Japan in the late 17th century and was popular until the turn of the 20th century. I imagine that you'll be familiar with the look of it, even if you aren't necessarily familiar with the name. The prime example is The Great Wave of Kanagawa by Katoshika Hokusai, the only one that anyone knows. The first of his 36 views of Mount Fuji, it's a piece that is stunning in both its simplicity and its detail, as the fast boats battle against the claw-like waves and you see the mountain in the negative space at the background. This is possibly the most famous image to ever come out of Japan, and with good reason in my opinion, it's beautiful and a really good representative of a part of this style. But Ukiyo-e was a lot more than just landscapes like these, though they're possibly my favourite given just the sheer variety of things you see. It was also used for mythological scenes, wildlife paintings, recreations of kabuki theatre and portraits. It encompasses multiple artistic movements from over two centuries of Japanese history, and it's well respected and admired by museums, galleries and collectors the world over. Which is interesting, considering that Ukiyo-e was trash. Okay, trash is a bit of an exaggeration, it was undoubtedly well liked and popular in its time, but it was far from being the high art that its position in galleries might suggest that it is today. This wasn't created for wealthy art patrons to hang up on the wall to show everyone how much good taste their money had bought them. This was a commercial endeavour, made for the common townsfolk. Ukiyo-e didn't become more popular with the wealthy until the West discovered it and brought it over here in our seemingly ever-present love of Japanism. The subject matter of a lot of ukiyo-e speaks to this more common audience that it was intended for. The portraits that I mentioned before tended to be of a few specific things. There were samurai warriors, kabuki actors, and women from the pleasure quarters. It was popular stuff made for mass appeal. Which is why a lot of it was just porn. Yeah, there is a whole subset of ukiyo-e just for erotic imagery. This is probably about as dirty as I can show you here because YouTube has some guidelines and a lot of my audience are asexual, you know? But if you want to check it out for yourself, then Google Shunga. Safe search off. It gets pretty explicit and honestly quite inventive. Like there was one I saw that was two guys standing next to a giant vagina with light shining out of it. Frankly, Western porn needs to get on the level of Shunga. But I think it's safe to say that if it's being used to make porn, then it's probably not high art. Which is not to say that porn and erotic imagery isn't art, it's all art, keep making smut, it's great. 
It's more just that the Western perception of ukiyo-e as being dignified and refined is quite at odds with its common origins. The art being made for the common person in this way led for a need for them to be mass-produced. They achieved this through carving the art into wooden blocks. These would be painted over and then printed onto paper to create the finished work. Using these blocks, the artists and their producers could recreate these pieces as many times as they thought that they could sell them, or until the blocks became too worn to be used anymore. It was a consumer market. People wanted to buy them, and so they made a lot of them to sell. For instance, the Great Wave of Kanagawa had somewhere between 5,000 to 8,000 copies made of it at the time, and there are still original copies in existence, with prints being housed in galleries like the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, and the National Gallery of Victoria. In fact, you could go see this at the British Museum, and then take a 25 minute tube journey and see it again at the V&A in the same afternoon. That's a pretty remarkable thing that you don't generally find with other paintings, with a few notable exceptions. Multiple different prints being held in multiple galleries and private collections, being sold for as high as $471,000 just last year. All at once, all just as authentic as each other, and all from an art form that was also used to make porn. How cool is that? So how does this relate to the movie? Well, it fits the theme kind of perfectly, doesn't it? The film is about the joy that can be found in a simple working class life, and how the traditions and roles of the upper class can stifle and remove a person's, particularly a woman's, humanity. So it seems to me that it appearing in an art style that existed primarily to be sold to the working class is only fitting. The movie is a work of beautiful art made to speak to those of us who have ever felt oppressed by the ruling class, and this is highlighted through the visuals. Now, this is obviously a bit of a nerdy over-reading of this. I mean, most people watching this film probably won't be familiar with the historical context of the art style and how that can be seen to heighten the message. You shouldn't have to do homework to get meaning out of a movie, you know? And you absolutely don't. I mean, that's why I talked about the themes a bit before I even mentioned the art style. But I do think that if you're willing to go looking into it, then it does add to the experience once you know it, and is fascinating and beautiful to learn about in its own right. Ukiyo means floating world, and ukiyoe, pictures of the floating world. Life in that time period was dominated by a certain kind of hedonism. People were living to the fullest, life was short and they were trying to make the most of it. This is what Kaguya is not permitted to do. She came to Earth to really live, and the tragedy of it is, is that it's taken away from her. In the floating world, she's shown a way to fly, and then gets rooted firmly to the ground. I would like to give an extra special thanks to my Ghost of Frankenstein patron, William Gray, my Son of Frankenstein patrons, Chris Harper and Fan the Mothra, and my Bride of Frankenstein patrons whose names are appearing on screen right now. If you'd like to join these wonderful people in supporting me, then head over to patreon.com slash davidjbradley, or click on the link in the end card. You'll get to see the videos early, get to see some bloopers from the videos, and get access to my Discord server. Plus, once we hit my next goal on there, then I'm going to make a video defending the 1998 Roland Emmerich Godzilla, and you know you want to see how I will manage to do that. But if not, then you could still like the video, subscribe, or watch one of the videos that I'm linking here.